Good morning, and welcome to worship on this seventh Sunday in Easter. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Day Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Before we begin today, I'd like to invite us to take a moment to share prayer requests from our community. You can share any prayers of concern or gratitude that you may have in the chat or the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Today we remember in prayer Rob P., who is recovering from successful so- shoulder surgery. Uh, we also pray for Martha J., who had successful cancer surgery last week and is now home recovering. And we hold Ken Fern's brother-in-law, Joey, in prayer this week. Uh, Joey was diagnosed with cancer, and so we hold him and his family in our prayers. You'll also have the opportunity to include your prayers during our intercessory prayers before we celebrate Holy Communion. I'll now invite you to turn to your bulletin as we continue with our order of service. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and Oh, God. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. 
Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that Scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my, my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O God. Did you happen to notice the amazing statement the elder made in this letter? Did it shock and astound you? I write these things to you, he says, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Your life is eternal. Not the life that comes next. Not the life that will be given to you after you die if you say or do or believe the right things. Your life, right now, is eternal. That doesn't seem right, does it? This life is clearly not eternal. In fact, it is quite finite. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. In fact, that's the problem, isn't it? The ride is great until the sudden stop at the end. And yet, the elder says that our life, the life we already have, the life that we are living right now, is eternal. And this is the proof that he gives, the testimony he offers in support of this outrageous claim. None other than the very word of God made flesh and living among us in the person of Jesus Christ. I read this and I think that maybe the problem is not with my reading ability or my Bible translation or my understanding of eternity, but with my definition of words like yours and mine. My life is finite. I know that I will die someday. But as we've been reading from the Gospel of St. John and the Elder's letter to his community, I think I'm beginning to understand that my life, the biological phenomenon of my consciousness and growth and learning, but also my sense of who I am as a person, isn't actually mine. 
it's mine in the sense that it's happening to me, that I experience it, but it doesn't belong to me, does it? I didn't work for it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I'm not on some kind of probation trying to prove my worthiness for it. I came into being completely without my knowledge or consent, and I will likely leave my being in exactly the same way. I'm also aware that I'm not unique in this. I am one of eight billion humans living in this world. There were people before me, and there will be people after me. I am a member of one among millions of species that call this planet home. I do not exist apart from this system, but as a result of it. When my life ends, it'll return to this system, and the system will continue on. I wonder if that might be a part of what the Elder wants us to understand, what God wants us to understand, that our lives aren't our own, that they belong to God. God creates and sustains life. And because eternal life is of God, and because God is eternal, then life itself is eternal. Maybe like matter or energy, life may change states or forms, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. A cube of ice that melts and evaporates seems to disappear, but the water's still there. It's just changed phase. It makes me think that the way we understand life is too small. And maybe that's why we hold on to it so tightly. If I understand my life as mine, then I alone am responsible for maintaining it protecting it. I have to keep it safe because it's the only one there is. But if I understand life as something larger than me, something eternal, something that it's a gift freely given, that it's not mine to protect or maintain, well then maybe that understanding changes how I live. What if the point of life, of eternal life, is not to hang on to it, but to let it go. To illustrate what I mean, I'm here in my backyard, surrounded by plants and insects and animals and sometimes dogs barking and leaf blowers going and planes flying overhead. But I'm here in my backyard and I look at this huckleberry bush and I think about how all these little leaves on it are little solar panels collecting energy from the sun so that this plant can survive and grow. The huckleberry takes that sunlight, light and energy which does not belong to it, but which it receives freely from the sun, and it grows these tiny little flowers. These flowers exist for the purpose of giving away that energy that this plant collects from the sun. The plant turns that energy into sugar, and it takes some of that sugar, and it puts it into the nectar of these flowers to just give away to bees and beetles and butterflies. Those creatures eat that nectar, and it gives them life, just like the plant takes life from it. And when those creatures collect that nectar, they also collect some of that pollen. And as they visit different huckleberries, they spread that pollen around, and that plant then succeeds in mating with different plants in different areas. In sharing its life, its life is multiplied rather than diminished. Later in the year, this plant is going to create tiny berries. It will pour more of that precious life-giving sugar into those berries that exist completely to be given away to be eaten by birds and bears. The seeds in those berries then pass through those birds and those bears and gets dropped on the ground. And if the conditions are right, a new huckleberry plant will sprout up and will start to grow and spread forth its leaves and share its life with the birds and the bees and the bears where it is. And once again, its life in, a, in the sharing is multiplied rather than diminished. 
This all reminds me of the Easter Vigil when we sing the Exalted. That great liturgical song celebrating the resurrection of Christ, symbolized in the lighting of the Paschal candle. At one point, the song goes, We sing the glories of this pillar of fire, the brightness of which is not diminished even when its light is divided and borrowed. For it is fed by the melting wax, which the bees, your servants, have made for the substance of this candle. The light of the candle represents the life of the risen Christ, a life which is shared and yet never diminished, because that life is eternal, a truth to which even the bees themselves testify for us with their gift of wax. Even the bees know that life is eternal. In fact, bees know this all too well. One bee may die, but the hive lives on. And so when the bees live, they live entirely for the hive. And so is it the bees who are alive or the hive? To which does that life truly belong? Now, you may look at me and you say, well, that's all well and good, but we're not bees. We don't live in a hive. Our world doesn't work that way. And you'd be right. That's not the way our world works. But that doesn't mean that the world is right. That does not mean that the way our world works is the only way that any world can work. Two weeks ago, Connie McLeod, a tribal elder and the cultural director for the Pialup tribe, spoke at our forum. Now, the Pialup are the people who belong to this land. They lived in this place long before we ever did. And she told us about the way the Pialup lived before the Europeans arrived. I was particularly struck by her description of trade. Pialop traders would take long expeditions, traveling by river and sea down the coast, as far away as what's now California, trading for wealth to bring home. But the Pialop did not measure wealth by what a person had. Instead, wealth was measured by what was given away. When a trader would return after months or even years of one of these trading expeditions, the chief would host a potlatch. Invitations would be sent to neighboring villages, and people would come from far and wide to the potlatch where everything, everything that the trader brought back would be given away. Not sold, not traded, given. That really struck me. Visitors from neighboring communities would be sent home with gifts, and the wealth accrued on that trading expedition was shared with everyone. That's a very different world than the only one we've ever known, isn't it? The Pialop in those days understood that all of our lives are interconnected, that we belong to one another. Without trying to romanticize the pre-colonial existence of the indigenous peoples, their way of life both testified to and was formed and formed within them an awareness of themselves as people and as communities that was greater than just the bodies they inhabited. An awareness that life itself is communal. Such an awareness allows us to hold on to these things less tightly to let go more easily because they knew that wealth and relationships and even life itself is no less ours when it's out of our possession. Conversely, letting go of such things may actually be able to help us gain greater awareness of life in its eternity. In the night before his arrest, the night before his execution, Jesus prays that his friends may have his joy in them, made complete in themselves. That's the night of his arrest, the night before he dies. What joy can there possibly be in suffering and death? Well, elsewhere in John's Gospel, Jesus reminds us that he freely lays down his life, that it's not being taken from him, 
and that because he lays it down, he also has the power to take it up again. He's not just dying. He is sharing his life with his friends. And that act of sharing is his joy. Like the nectar of the flower or the light of the candle, in sharing his life, it's not diminished, but multiplied. To us who are so well acquainted with the joys of holding on and clinging to, Jesus wishes nothing more than to share the joy of letting go, of giving up, of laying down. Maybe that joy is even that in laying down, we find that our life is still ours because it belongs to God. Father Thomas Keating has a poem entitled Out of Nothing. He writes of finding the presence of God in the loss of everything else. To be nothing is to consent to be a simple creature. This is the place of the encounter with I am that I am. When there is no more me, myself, or mine, only I am remains. Then the I may fall away, leaving just the am. When we let go, when everything to which we cling so tightly, our possessions and control, even our sense of I, our sense of self and the ideas and the images and the labels that we use to give ourselves meaning and identity, when all of those things are stripped away, all that remains is the life which is at the very core of our being, the life which is the light of all people, the light which comes from God and returns to God. All that is left when the rest of us is gone is God. And God is eternal. I believe that's what the elder is trying to tell us. That this is the joy that Jesus wishes to have made complete in us. That we are who we are only in union with God. And with one another. He came to give us the courage to trust this union with God by modeling it for us by testifying to it with his entire being. This union, the elder writes, is not merely some place that we hope for in the future, the idea of heaven or life after death. It's the place from which we start. It's where we come from. It's the place that we're called to live in now. This mystical union among all creatures in the eternity of God means that we don't have to hold so tightly to everything. That, in fact, by letting go, we may actually be able to experience life more fully and more vibrantly than we ever could otherwise, because we may finally know that life doesn't stop at the tips of our fingers or our toes, that life itself comes from God and returns to God, that it flows in us and through us and beyond us. Knowing that, or at least hoping for it, we might even be able to begin to experience fleeting glimpses of that oneness that comes from knowing that God is our core. I wonder how we might be changed by this mystery. I wonder how our congregation might be changed by it. I wonder what our lives and our life together looks like when we can let go of the joy of holding on to those lives and instead embrace the joy of laying those lives down for one another. To share that life and to experience that it is not diminished, but multiplied. It has implications not just for how we think about death, but for how we treat our neighbors, how we treat our enemies. It changes how we spend our money or where we choose to live or our patterns of consumption and production, what we eat, what we wear, with whom we choose to associate. In short, it affects our entire lives, our entire eternal lives, because those lives 
are not ours. They belong to God. And because they belong to God, they belong to all of this, to everyone. But most of all, I wonder how the life of one man, killed on a cross, can still give us life all these centuries later. How that life, divided and shared among so many people across so many generations, across time and space, rather than being diminished, has in fact multiplied. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Holy God, in Christ Jesus the joy of the Church is made complete. Root the Church in your word and unify us as Christ's body. Send us into the world as your loving people ready to testify to your spirit at work. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Mighty God, the world is your handiwork, displaying your creative impulse. Seas teem with life, forests reach up to praise you, and the mystery of life lies deep in the soil. Guard and keep this world for the joy and well-being of all your creatures. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gracious, sovereign God, those who follow your ways are like trees planted near streams of water. Establish the leaders of nations 
and all in authority in your grace and truth. Strengthen them so that the people they serve will have justice and truly abundant life. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Generous Savior, you befriend and comfort those who mourn, those who are suffering, those who live in poverty, those who are lonely, outcast, rejected. We pray for those who are sick, especially those living in India, and others we name silently or in our hearts. Grant healing and love to all in need. Give them tangible signs of your steadfast love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Creator God, here in this community, we share the gift of praying, learning, and supporting one another. Give us thankful hearts as we claim the gifts that are unique to us and keep us from being envious of others with different gifts that we might live in harmony to serve you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Saving God, your wonderful promise is the gift of eternal life in Jesus. Through the witness of those who have died in you, strengthen us now in this gift of life. We cherish the memory of all your saints, especially those we name before you now in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the hope of the new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We all know that as Christians, we are called to be generous. On this day, Lutheran Church is blessed with a congregation that is very generous. A short search through the past few months of the Agnes Day monthly newsletter supplied the ministries and activities that our members have generously given of their time, their talent, and their finances to support the mission here at Agnes Day Lutheran Church. It is the words from this search that make up the heart that is on the screen before you. Many times when Christians talk about being good stewards, they often refer to being generous with your time, your talent, and your treasure. These areas are often intertwined with each other. All of the music that is provided by our members is a good example of this. We have many talented musicians at Agnes Day that we would never hear from if they were not willing to share that talent with us. Think about what we would be missing each week if these musicians were too uncomfortable getting up in front of the congregation to share with us. No matter how talented our musicians are, they still give of their time to practice so that they are ready to perform during the service. On a side note, I saw in the May newsletter that the choir is practicing as a group again by meeting outside. Let us all pray for good weather. I would like to share an experience that Debbie and I had recently where different groups intertwined to minister to us. Debbie recently had knee replacement surgery, and I asked Cindy to put her on the prayer chain. We would like to thank everyone who gave of their time to pray for a successful surgery and healing, as well as those who sent cards of support. And yes, everything is going well. The prayer shawl ministry also got involved and asked Debbie if she would like one of their shawls. In the next picture, Debbie is modeling her prayer shawl just before we left for her physical therapy on Thursday. I would be remiss if I did not point out that giving generously of our finances to Agnes Day is an important way that we can support all of these activities and ministries of our church. Please plan on attending the congregational meeting that takes place immediately following this service. One of the items that we will be discussing is the financial situation of Agnes Day as we hopefully near the end of the many difficulties brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, 
Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. Alleluia. Glory to you, O God, for from the garden to the wilderness, through exile, oppression, and return, you have delivered your people time and again from the grip of death. In the depths of darkest night, your word has shone as a beacon through your servants, the prophets, promising life and love in the face of death. That light became flesh and lived among us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has raised up from the earth to draw all people to himself. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Reveal our risen Lord to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up with Jesus as the body of Christ for the world. Believing in the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and join with all your saints scattered in houses and apartments and even in graves in the feast which has no end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal this morning, receive this blessing. May the joy of the risen Christ be in you, and may your joy be made complete. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, Hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
May the body and blood of our risen Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put your gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First is that today is Anya's Day's uh, congregational meeting. If you're a voting member of this congregation, please use the link or the phone number provided in the Thursday email to log in. We'll be electing new board members uh, for Little Lamb's Preschool and the Church Council, as well as getting an update on the budget for the year and some exciting ministry developments in the life of our congregation. Please attend if you're able. If you're having difficulty connecting, please give me a call and I'll help you as best as I can. Also, I mentioned last week that we are once again um, uh, exploring uh, forming a refugee resettlement committee uh, to continue the work that we began in 2017, uh, working once again with Peninsula Lutheran Church If you have any interest in being a part of a team that would help organize that so that we can do that, please contact Sister Anne so that we can put you in touch uh, with the folks uh, who also are interested and get that going. Thank you for being a part of this community. It is good to gather as God's people to be renewed in faith and reassured of God's promises. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel where On You Stay gathers for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. And be sure to find us on the web at onyoustaylutheran.org, where you can get involved with Bible studies, service groups, and many other ministries aimed at loving and serving our neighbors here and in the world. Most of our small groups are meeting uh, via Zoom this week, including the Gather Bible Study and Theology on Tap. The Prayer Shell Knitters are meeting half online and half in the church parking lot, And the Wednesday morning tech study is going to experiment this week with going hybrid. We will have a few people gathered here in the building, but then also have the ability for folks to join us still via Zoom. Um, You can find all the details for those things uh, in person and online gatherings on our website. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. You are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God. The peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Thank you.